Hi everyone, I'm KVU senior reporter Tony Plaheski. Thank you for joining us. The murder trial for Austin police officer Christopher Taylor and the death of Michael Ramos began with opening statements today. This is believed to be the first time an Austin officer has faced murder charges in connection with an on-duty shooting. And the case continues to be polarizing both inside the courtroom and in the community. You may recall that in April 2020, Austin police officers were called to a Southeast Austin apartment complex to investigate possible drug dealing. The caller said that Ramos had a gun, but police later confirmed that he did not. Police say Ramos did not obey their commands, and that's when they used a so-called beanbag round on him. Moments later, Ramos got into a car and started driving. Officer Taylor opened fire, shooting and killing Ramos. Bystanders captured the shooting and the video and images instantly sparked community attention and questions about the shooting. One month later, Ramos's death fueled social justice protests in Austin following the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis. We've invited two local attorneys, Jorge Vela and Elizabeth Resendez, to help us analyze and break down opening statements today. And when we say opening statements, it was really just one statement because it is extremely noteworthy that the defense did not provide an opening statement today. So I just want to start by asking both of you, and Jorge, I'll start with you, about that calculation, that decision to not actually make an opening statement by the defense today. Well, Tony, uh, I made a prediction to you before we you started did. this you case. You did. I did. And I predicted that Doug and Ken Irvin were going to reserve their opening. And I predicted that for two reasons. One, I've seen Doug do it before in the last uh, police officer that he defended in court, and it was extremely effective when he did it. When you reserve your opening in my, as a defense attorney, which you have the option to do, in my opinion, it helps you control the narrative a little bit more. In this case, that is even more important. And that's the second reason why I thought Doug was gonna do it again, wh why he was gonna reserve his opening. And the reason is because usually in these types of cases, law enforcement officers are the state's strongest witnesses. They're the ones that build the case against the accused. But this is not any ordinary case. In this case, we are dealing with a law enforcement defendant. And I believe, and I think it's pretty obvious, that most of the witnesses that are going to come forward are not going to be in the state's favor. They're not going to build the state's case. I, I predict that they are going to be more favorable to the defense. And so by reserving his opening statement, I think that he is anticipating, Doug and Kevin, they're both anticipating that they're going to present these law enforcement witnesses as their own witnesses. That gives them the chance to literally control the narrative in the whole trial, even though it's not their burden. They are controlling the trial by reserving their statement. They're getting the last word. And then they're going to present their defense and turn all those law enforcement witnesses that are supposed to be for the state to their favor. But Elizabeth, you saw it as a potentially really risky move, right? Oh, absolutely. So I think it's it's kind of amazing. Uh, Jorge and I see this so differently, um, but I love it. Yeah, so I think it's potentially very risky. Not only did you have the state get up there, they made their points. I think they did a great job kind of explaining all of the issues that they actually do have with Michael Ramos, their victim in this case. There are some, but they put it out there. They weren't afraid of it. They didn't hide from his criminal history. It's not extreme, but they did put it out there. And at this point, you have all of that without another side presented. I think that's troublesome. I think the jury is sitting there with only one perspective. And now every time they see a piece of evidence or hear a witness you know, testify, all they're going to be thinking of is the state's perspective without any other way to view it. I want to ask both of you the same, the same question again, and that is uh, with regard to the opening statements by the state, two of their main points seem to be, number one, that Christopher Taylor was the only officer among a group of about seven officers who's fired, and number two, that Michael Ramos, according to the state, was only attempting to flee. Jorge, how important are those two points to this case? I think they're important to the state's case. But I think that defense just needs to do a good job turning the focus to another video that is not as talked about uh, in recent news stories. There is a video that I saw last night that I was uh, unaware of how important it was until I saw it, but 
there's a video that is coming from a patrol unit that captures the scene from, the point of view from behind all the officers. And at one point it actually shows multiple officers moving out of the way. And one assumes that they're doing that once Michael Ramos starts to leave in the car. You brought up opening statements. And so I wanna circle back to that. They did focus on those two things, but I think that the state dropped the ball in opening statements. And I think one statement literally broke their case. The prosecutor, when he was giving his opening statement, said that after Michael Ramos was impacted by the non-lethal beanbags, that he got into his vehicle, that at one point he closed the door and then began to fumble around in his vehicle. And his own words were, a reasonable person could think that he was reaching for a weapon. To me, that's case closed. It's one thing to hear that from the defense, that argument that Michael Ramos could have been reaching for a weapon, but to hear the state prosecutor, just that one line, say that a reasonable person, which is the legal standard here, could have thought that Michael Ramos was reaching for a weapon at that point before he started driving, I think breaks the case open for defense. To me, it's almost case closed, hearing that from the prosecutor. And I think they dropped the ball in the opening statements. I don't think it was strong enough I think they stated things that are gonna favor defense and the defense is gonna jump all over when they get the chance to go in front of that jury and give their opening statement. What did you think, Elizabeth, about the strength of the, of the state's opening statement? I agree that I do not think it was strong enough. We have a very um, intense subject matter. This is a very serious case that affects the lives, not obviously just of Michael Ramos, but other people in the community. And I thought that it could have been more impassioned. However. I do disagree with the idea that um, the state bringing up that Michael Ramos was fumbling with something in the vehicle, I still think that they needed to address that because that is gonna come up from defense. And if you're gonna try to hide from it, it's gonna come back to haunt you. You saw it as almost neutralizing an effort by the defense. Correct, I think they needed to make that statement because if they didn't, it would come back later and it would look like they weren't credible. They're giving credit where it needs to go but at the same time following it up with, but you hear their commands, they're saying, don't do it, Michael, don't leave. If that comes out, if what they're saying to him is don't drive off, then they're not worried about a weapon at that point. Elizabeth, what did you make of the, the statement that, that the prosecutor, Dexter Guilford, really seemed to drive home, which is Michael Ramos was just trying to get away. Plain and simple, that's it. I think that tends to hold up, at least with everything we've seen so far. I don't know what's gonna come out in evidence. I haven't obviously seen it all, but with if they can deliver on what they showed during opening statements with those diagrams, with those pictures, with those videos, if they're gonna show him driving away from officers, I just really think that um, the defense is just gonna have a hard time. I wanna ask both of you too, as the jury was walked in and, and took their positions. I'm sure you, like me, were eyeing each of them, sort of sizing up, if you will, this, this panel, this member, 12 members of our community who will decide Christopher Taylor's fate. As you looked at them, I mean, again, we can only assess what we can see with our own eyes, uh, but what was your idea about, about the jury? Jorge, I'll start with you. I think it was a diverse pool. Um, that they had sitting in the box. Um, it's hard to get those initial impressions. I wish I was uh, there during the, the entire voir dire process to hear all of their answers. Um, but you never know. You know, as a trial attorney, you're constantly scanning the box to see the reactions, whether it's from a, something a witness said or whether they're trying to judge your client as a defense attorney. But a lot of times you're just guessing uh, as a defense attorney. And it's an art form. You, you really have to try to read people as best as possible, but sometimes it's impossible. Sometimes you think that a certain juror is gonna be your juror, the one that's gonna win it for you back there in the delivery room, and turns out after the trial, you find out that they just hated you. <laughs> they just, <laughs> right. the whole time were judging They were arguing you. against you yeah, the whole time. Exactly, it's tough. It's tough uh, to give an initial first impression. Yeah, did you, did you get one though, Elizabeth? You know, the only initial impression I got was that they are taking this very seriously. Because throughout that opening statement, at least from the state, there were people coming in and out of that courtroom throughout the entire thing. It was quite loud, and none of them broke their attention. 
They focused on the state. They focused on the prosecutor giving his opening statement. Not one of them turned their eyes and looked. They're taking this really seriously. I think that's all we can really ask and that's all we can really know. As much as we want to try to guess where people are, I do think it's a fool's errand. You might think, like Jorge's saying, that they're following you all along, you know, throughout your, your trial. And then at the end, you find out the whole time they're thinking, oh my God, I was just feeling so sorry for you that you're dealing with this case because you had <laughs> nothing going for you. So you, you can't really tell what they're actually thinking. Getting back to the decision by the defense uh, attorneys, Doug O'Connell and Ken Irvin, not to make an opening statement, they can elect to do so, correct, Elizabeth, when they begin presenting their own case. Is that typically the way this, this would work? Correct, yeah. If they decide to reserve the right to give their opening statement, they'll just give it after the state closes. So they'll start um, their opening once the state closes and they are ready to present their side of the argument. Jorge, just looking ahead to the next couple of weeks, um, obviously we're going to hear from experts, we're going to hear from police officers who are at the scene. Uh, how important is it that we hear from Christopher Taylor himself? <laughs> you know, it's one of the questions that every trial attorney will ask during Vore Dyer, right? This uh, question as to whether or not the jurors can respect the accused right against self-incrimination, Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. Whenever something happens, it's natural for humans to want to hear both sides. But we have to remember that in a criminal courtroom, the burden of proof always rests with the state of Texas. And there are certain constitutional protections um, that are there because um, we are ultimately dealing with somebody's liberty. And in this case, because the burden always lies with the state of Texas, jurors must respect defense's position or defense's request for their defendant not to, for their uh, client not to testify. And so, you know, while we may want to hear from them, I, I think it's important to stress to everybody, to the jurors, to the public, to anybody, um, that it's important they respect and understand why a defense attorney may not want to put their client on the stand and subject them to cross-examination from a trained prosecutor that's going to try to trip them up and manipulate what they say. The defense doesn't have to prove that their client is innocent. It's the state's burden, and so therefore they should be the ones that present the evidence. The focus should be on their side of the, the courtroom, not on our client, not on the accused. Elizabeth, if you're defending Christopher Taylor, do you put him on the stand or encourage him to take the stand? It is 100% his decision, but yes, absolutely, I think he needs to take the stand. Uh, of course, it, he does not have to. It is his right not to testify. And, of, and the jurors are supposed to not consider that, but I think we're all human beings. I think we do want to hear from that other side in this type of case when we're deciding what was, what, if what he did was reasonable under the circumstances, they're gonna to wanna to know what was going through your head. And if they don't have that answer, they're gonna have a really hard time, I think, at all understanding his position. If those videos that we have seen, if there's not something major to change that, to change what we see, I just really don't see how he cannot testify. A couple of other questions I wanted to just talk to you both about, and that is Officer Christopher Taylor is in a unique position for multiple reasons. Not only is he the first police officer maybe and forever to be charged with murder, but he also faces a second murder charge in an unrelated on-duty shooting that happened in 2019 in downtown Austin. According to officials, he shot a man who was suffering from a mental break. Uh, Christopher Taylor's attorney say that he fired when, when that man came at him with a knife. Does that second case or the details of that second case come into play, and if so, how in this particular trial, Jorge? You know, the Michael Ramos shooting is without a doubt a very controversial case. It is tough, even from a defense attorney perspective, it is tough to make a 100% certain decision as to whether or not that shooting was justified. I, I, any rational person could see that this is a very controversial case, but to attempt to resurface an old police shooting involving Christopher Taylor because of this new police shooting, I think is unjustified. 
Personally, um, from my understanding, the previous shooting was already determined to be justified uh, because the individual at that time posed a danger to Christopher Taylor uh, because he had a, a deadly weapon in his hand uh, and the officer that was with uh, Christopher Taylor. For the district attorney's office to take a second look at that and then all of a sudden change their mind, th the facts of that case never changed. The the lens by which the district attorney's office saw that case did change, but I don't think that justifies bringing that case back up. You ask if the case can be used against Christopher Taylor. Yes, it can be. There are certain exceptions. Usually, extraneous offenses or other crimes or bad acts are not allowed in a criminal trial, right? We're there to determine whether or not he committed this offense alleged, and extraneous conduct is irrelevant. However, there are certain exceptions, and one of those exceptions may be planning, intent, knowledge, things like that. I think the state will rely on an argument that it shows intent of Christopher Taylor to be trigger happy, to be whatever, it's to, to have intent to kill another individual. But I, I would be surprised if the judge let it in, honestly. How about you, Elizabeth? I agree, I'd be very surprised if it comes in yeah. unless uh, defense opens the door somehow. Now, he is going to be have to, um, excuse me, um, Officer Taylor is going to have to be careful because if he chooses to testify, which is his right, he has to be very careful not to say anything that will allow that first case in. If he makes a comment saying, I've never done anything like this before, this is the worst thing that's ever happened to me, I couldn't imagine ever killing somebody, anything that shows that nothing like this has happened, um, it could open the door and we could have that case come in. Predictions on how long this proceeding will last? I think about two weeks. Yeah, how about yeah. you, Elizabeth? Yeah, I don't see it going three weeks. I'm thinking about a week and a half, two weeks. I think that's right. Yeah. Okay, well, we appreciate your time and expertise and may very well ask, ask you to come back to help us untangle this as, as the trial proceeds over the next several weeks. The case is expected to last possibly up to four weeks. At least that is how long the court has set aside for, uh, for the trial. The judge is not allowing live streaming, so you can't watch it live, but we'll be analyzing future big days in the case, including when key witnesses are called to testify. Thank you again for joining us.